This is another episode of the Speak Easy Podcast, and I am your host, Altavis Spelzer, the voice coach, professional speaker, certified life coach, and Amazon bestselling author. I, guys, I'm excited. I am like, I have been doing backflips for the last week because of this next guest, simply because um, I love his journey. I love everything that he's been doing. But I got to catch one of his live streams uh, about a week or so ago, and it was completely in sign language. That just, it put such a, if you see the smile on my face right now, that's the smile that I had as soon as I saw it. Because uh, a lot of times, those who are hearing impaired go through a lot. We know that those who are vision impaired go through a lot. And so just having that moment of empowering those who were hearing impaired, that was amazing. I loved it. And being a speaker, being an author, being an entrepreneur, it's all, when we think about the the, the cornerstone of it, when we think about the foundation, it's about empowering other people, right? That's what it is. That's where we get on stage. That's why we write the books. That's why we started the business. Yeah, we want to make money from it. Don't, let's not get it twisted. Yes, we want to be paid, but it's about empowering people. And you go so much further when you get that opportunity to empower people. And so I want to say hello and welcome to our guest. Hey, Jim. Hey, how's it going? (laughs) Going good. And so I want you to tell the audience a little bit about yourself and then we'll dive right into today's topic. Okay. Well, uh, my name's Jim Beach. So um, the one thing that, that makes my story unique is that I am a CODA, which is C-O-D-A, child of deaf adults both my parents being profoundly deaf. Sign language was my first language. So growing up in a home where we spoke with our hands starting elementary school was very difficult. Life was challenging. Um, I had to believe in uh, authorities, what I thought were authority figures, to trust that they knew what they were talking about and uh, struggled because of that until I learned to overcome by meeting one of the most influential people in my life, which I would love to talk about when that moment comes. So that is amazing in itself, because we know that this journey of deciding that you're going to be a speaker, you're going to be an author, you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to have something. There's nobody that makes it to that level without overcoming something, without standing up against the grain, without, you know, having to get up after we've fallen, after we've stumbled, after we've kind of like bruised our knees and elbows sometimes. And so... One of the things that I really love, especially with the title of your book, is that, listen, we have, and I I always tell it to people like this, you know, we have labels that people place upon us. And they they tell us, you know, we're too thin, we're too this, we're too that, we're, we're not educated enough, we're overly educated. There's so many different labels that people place upon us. And that struggle is to remove the labels and say, no, I'm going to show up in my best self. So in the beginning of that journey, what was that aha moment that made you say, you know what? I know what they said, but here's what I'm going to do anyway. Well, that was a a moment that had to come through another. And what I mean by that was the, the title of my book being the nickname that didn't stick as a child, because of the fact that I could not communicate, um, properly or effectively without using my hands, which uh, I'm a part of Toastmasters. And one of the things that gets put down on my critique sheet, which I, that's what I call it. A critique sheet is I move my hands too much. Well, my wife tells everybody, look, that's never going to change. He's an interpreter for the deaf. So my hands are always going, but in kindergarten, when they started realizing I couldn't talk well, I wasn't a foreigner and I used my hands a lot. They thought there was something wrong with me. So the kids would call me retard. And they would literally call me that when they were calling for me to get involved in something or tell me to go away or whatever. They always used retard. Um, There's so I struggled a lot through life fighting. Um, I was bullied a lot. I've got a permanent black eye. Matter of fact, I just seen a dermatologist recently that said the trauma was not going to go away unless they did something, but didn't see any reason for it. But there's a black eye here permanently from a beating that I got. 
you know, growing up trying to be tough or defend myself, those kind of things. But the turning point in my life to realize that I can overcome the labels that I was given, uh, overcome the self-defeating beliefs because I believed what they were saying about me. And we're talking about not just the kids, but the, the school officials told me that I was either mentally handicapped or had a severe learning disability. And they told me this by having me interpret that to my parents. So here I am in a meeting with my parents to tell them the principal, the counselor, and the teacher all believe that I have this, this problem and that I wouldn't amount to much of anything just to do the best I could. So I met the most influential person in my life at the age of 20, and that happens to be today my wife of 21 years. My, uh, my wife came to me when we were dating. I told her she wanted to have a lot of kids, and I told her there was no way I could because I wouldn't financially be able to provide. As a matter of fact, my wife is here, so I just just letting you know she's listening to all this. This is the absolute truth. But while I was telling her that I couldn't, she finally asked, "Wait a minute, why do you believe all this?" And I told her about the school officials, and she said, first of all, they lied to you, and you don't have to believe them and live the way they told you." So for the first two years of our marriage, she gave me a formal education, and then I went into the business world, went into the medical field went into marketing, became a success, was put on stage, and somebody that, that was asking me to be on stage asked if he could introduce me and wanted to know my story before he did. When he heard my story, he said, man, you were absolutely relentless. So when he put me on stage, he said, folks, I want to introduce you to Jim Beach, Mr. Relentless. So the label I had as a kid, being, the, being retard is the nickname that I was given, I finally realized that day on stage, wow. I'm no longer retard. I'm Mr. Relentless. So the nickname didn't stick. It didn't stay that way because my wife taught me to overcome. And because of that, sometimes, you know, she's not too happy about it because I excelled in English. So sometimes I correct her and she's like, I wish I would have never taught you English. <laughs> yeah, she's over here laughing at me right now. That's, but that's the way it goes. So that was my aha moment is when I actually had someone to believe in me. Someone that said, you are not what they say you are, and you can be better than what anybody says you are. So that was my aha moment. Oh my goodness, that is so amazing. I'm often telling people that, you know, a lot of times we're scared to do something. We're scared to get started. We're scared to move and, and shake and, and, and do all these amazing things because we think that the, because the people around us don't necessarily um, push us. They don't necessarily uh, support what we're doing. But the reality is, is a lot of times if we just start moving, the person that's going to be our biggest support shows up and they don't know yeah. our name yet. So that's I love right. that. I love that. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, trust me. The crowd usually does too, because after the show is done and I come down to greet and meet with people, they're usually circling my wife and talking to her and shaking her hand. And so she gets all the fame. She, she definitely deserves the attention she gets because of what she's done for me. Awesome. So I've been following you as Mr. Relentless um, back, I think maybe about two years now from Periscope. And I think that was the first time that I came in contact with you. Um, and it's just been, you know, an ongoing thing. Now, have you found it difficult? Because I know that you said that you did Toastmasters. And I know Toastmasters, they do teach you a lot of the basics and a lot of the, the structure of, you know, being a speaker. But as things have changed within the last two years, I know that you do very well with social media and you do very well with doing live stream. Have you seen that to be a big influence or a big support and a big help in you getting out your message to people? Yes, actually, it's, 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 it happened by accident in some ways. Now, I, I know as some people say accidents don't happen. Everything happens for a reason. But I think the reason, if I would say there was a reason, is because I didn't give up. Um, I, I gave up on Periscope just because there was just some issues with timing. And, and I'm an interpreter for the deaf, a licensed and certified interpreter for the deaf. And my I'm a freelance, so I'm everywhere all times of the day, so I can't just do something at a set time of the day. And I was noticing that most of the people that were succeeding or doing well on Periscope um, were, were the ones that had a set time of the day. And I, I just didn't feel like it was a good fit. 
when I did a Facebook live, it was all because my pastor's wife was doing what's called V60. And she, um, first lady Balo, I don't remember, I don't know if you remember her, but she used to be on Periscope, a dynamic speaker on Periscope, big, big force to be reckoned with. Um, we call her sister Barlow, Barlow and, uh, she does these D60s where you get on Facebook and for 60 seconds, you do nothing but biblical inspiration because of so much negativity in the world. Well, I started to do that and I noticed the attention I was getting and I thought, huh, Facebook Live has a different dynamic. So I'm going to give that a, a different try. And uh, then um, one of the uh, friends of my parents' past, so to speak, um, knew that I was a CODA and knew that my parents were deaf and reached out to me and said, hey, it's not fair. You're doing all them videos. Do one in sign language, too, so that we can see your message, because I know that you know the Bible, and I know you know sign language, so do a Bible one for us. And he's a deaf pastor down in Mississippi. So I said, okay, I'll give it a try. Well, I tried, and that video got about 16,000 views, and I thought, wow, okay, there's a complete difference here. So I did a video on purpose um, that was to help spread awareness of bullying and deafness because people think that deafness is a handicap. Um, so like for instance, deaf people do not like to be called hearing impaired. At least the majority of them that I have known say, I'm not hearing impaired, I'm deaf because they believe deafness is a culture, not a, a handicap. So um, I did this video about bullying because my brother as a child, he was best friends with a deaf kid and the deaf kid would um, defend him against bullies. Bullies would try and, and get to him, but because they would stay together, the two of them, the bullies never really got to my brother. Well, the, the best friend moved away, um, maybe because of schooling for, uh, for his deafness or, you know, whatever the case might be. So my brother wanted to play with somebody, and the only thing, the only kids he could find were the kids that were the bullies, and he tried to find a way in. Well, they were going swimming, and he went with them. I can remember the day my mom got the knock on the door. Friends had come over to talk to her and let her know that my older brother had drowned and he was eight years old. And the story comes back that it's possible that the bullies got to him, but nobody knows because nobody's seen him drown, which was a very suspicious statement. How does nobody see, you know, how a kid would drown? How did, how did nobody notice, you know, those kind of things. So anyway, long story short, I share that on Facebook, understand the understanding of deafness and, and understanding bullying. And I did it with little index cards. That, I don't know if you've seen that video, but um, it, that video was actually taken by AI media and um, repopulated or repurposed. And it reached 159,000 views. And I guess it's reaches over a million. So yeah, it definitely, the social media from Facebook totally and radically changed my life. I have more speaking gigs. Um, being requested for more interviews and those kind of things. So yeah, social media definitely plays a role um, in, in how, where I'm going and where I am today as far as, you know, getting my message out there. So what I would tell anybody that if they're doing social media, don't give up. Just find that niche, find that moment, that moment that changes everything. And uh, sooner or later, you'll find it because there are people out there that want your message or that want to share your message. So, or want your message and share your message at the same time, which is what's currently happening. And uh, just signed a contract with, I don't know if you know who Viral Hog is, but just signed a contract with them. So in hopes to end up on the Ellen show with that same story. So looking forward to that being a possibility. <laughs> oh my goodness. I am here for it. Look, I don't even watch television on a regular basis, but I would sit and watch that episode and <laughs> over and over again simply because, again, I love what it is that you're doing. And when we think about this author and speaker journey, I always ask everybody that comes on, I say, you know, what has been a blunder for you in this journey so far? What has been something that you look back and you're like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have did that that way. Maybe I shouldn't have did that at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that happens often. <laughs> So have you had any, and if so, what's one of those blunders that you've gone through? Uh, well, you know, one of the most memorable for me is the very first one. 
Um, when I first got on Periscope, I, you know, I, I, I teach people how to do some of these videos nowadays because some of these people will do the video with their faces way down here. And if the comments are coming up, you can't see their face because they're just covered up. Um, and then you got some people that have it laid down on the coffee table. So you're looking right up their nose and all those kind of things. But it took some trial and error for me to even learn this kind of stuff. But the very first time I got on video, man, I was pumped up. I was, I'm going to share this motivational. And, and when I hit that live button, I thought, oh, uh, these are random people. And what if I get a ton of people on here? Who's going to see this? Are they going to say the negative stuff? I was real worried about it at that moment. And I saw one person hop on. So I started saying, hey, where are you calling from? And I thought, oh, no, I've already messed it up. And then a second person come on. I said, okay, cool. So I started to try and talk, and I noticed both of them jumped off. So I didn't even like my own video, so I jumped off too. <laughs> so my, my first video was horrible, um, horrible enough that I would, didn't like it, and I took a seat. But, but because I went on and on, I learned how to do it better, how to, how to improve. But one of the blunders, too, that I think um, a couple of times, one recently and and one sometime back is where some people had some very nasty things to say. And uh, one was in reference to another person. And I thought to get on Periscope. And basically, I didn't know who the person was, still don't know who the person was. But I know that they were uh, basically attacking somebody I know. So I got on Facebook and talked about how great this person is. And that person has no right to do that. And that was basically an attack on somebody else. Even though I wasn't insulting them, I was still chewing them out, in, so to speak. And then recently, I got on a video and talked about what somebody had done to me. So I looked at that in two aspects. One, I was attacking somebody else without really directly attacking them. And two, I was playing a victim role. So both of those, neither one did really it did any good for anybody so those are the two things i i really took away from blunders is one don't be somebody that even cares about what somebody else says because if you do you can be consumed by it you can mess up your reputation by it those kind of things and being the victim definitely you're going to be attracting the wrong crowd because misery loves company right so those are two blunders i would definitely say are my biggest other than not liking my own video and jumping off <laughs> I definitely have to agree with you on that one. I know that on Periscope, I tell people all the time, I said, as an introvert, Periscope was great for me because if you can handle trolls, you can handle just about anything because they'll yeah. come on and say everything and anything. And it really is a tug of war sometimes because you're trying not to respond. You're trying to stay focused. You're trying to, you know, keep on the task at hand and they'll come on and say that your eyes are crossed or that, that your hair is the wrong color. I mean, they'll say anything and you're just like, <sighs> yeah, <laughs> right. but we got to think about that because it relates to us in real life as well. Cause we're going to have people that come up against us when we decide that it's time to take those labels off. You're going to tell you, there's going to be people that say, no, that label is supposed to be there. It's there for a reason. There are going to be people that tell you, well, you're not going to make it without that label. Mm -hmm. Right. So we do come up against that same struggle on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I said, you know, you, you got to get out there. You got to just, you got to just handle it. Sometimes you got to just see what's going to come your way, but definitely and people say, you know, well, all publicity is good publicity and that's not true. Mm. Yeah. That's I would agree. All. When you're especially a, if you create it. <laughs> exactly. And when you're in a position where you're trying to help people, you don't want negative publicity. I don't I don't care what level you're on. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's not something you want. So now What's coming next? So we, we, we talked about, okay, we're working on getting on Ellen. I love that. I'm excited about that. But from the beginning until now, you've exploded. And I'm, I'm sure that it's, of course, more from, you know, more than what I've been able to see because I've only followed you for about two years. So what's next, though? Like, what's next on the, on, like, what's next on the horizon? Well, I don't know if it's necessarily next, but one of the things that's been a part of my message that I want to become louder and louder is um, Christianity in, in just in essence, but understanding having a relationship with God and how important it is. Um, 
you know, I, I wasn't too vocal about it before because people were saying, don't say so much about it because you lose audiences. And, you know, when I made that first viral video, the one that's got 160,000 and still climbing has over almost 4,000 shares. All of that was, uh, the message in it was about forgiveness. Because if I wasn't able to forgive those bullies, then I wouldn't be able to move on. I'd be obsessed or I would be consumed with trying to figure out how to get them arrested or even though it's been 40 years and those kind of things, not, not quite 40 years, but you know what I mean? And, and just, it, it, it just um, understanding that forgiveness is powerful because if I couldn't have forgiven them, the way that I look at it, people have asked me, well, don't you feel like they need justice? And I thought, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. Maybe I've never done anything that drastic, of course. But when it comes to Jesus, if, if he can forgive somebody for doing something like that, then I'm going to pray he does. And hopefully if I meet that person in heaven and realize that, that God forgiven them, why would I be bitter about it down here and then try and go up there and see them up there? I couldn't do it. But knowing that God has the power and the ability to, to forgive them and change their life to where they don't hurt anybody else means more to me than to know that they're, they're going to be behind a prison bar for the rest, of, you know, prison bars for the rest of their life. Um, you know, and another thing is the, the power of forgiveness has been something that has happened often in my life. And um, one of them was being growing up, being bullied. I talked about being involved in gangs. Um, I was in a gang in Las Vegas, Nevada. And then when I moved away, I was in a gang in Kansas city, Missouri. And, um, both of those gangs, I wasn't supposed to leave those gangs. Uh, the gang in Las Vegas, after I cleaned up my life and tried to change my life, I heard the gang was coming after me. I got a phone call from somebody that was involved in the gang and said, they're coming after you. They found out where you're at. And I told him, I said, man, I'm, I'm married. I've got kids. Life's different for me. No, it didn't matter. You didn't get a pardon. Um, you know, and then the, the, the Kansas City gang, the leader of the gang was in prison. Well, he was getting out. He called me about the same week that the other ones called me and said, I found you, I'm coming looking for you, we need to talk. And I went to my pastor and I said, what am I supposed to do? And he goes, let me ask you something, because I was very irate. I said, if I see him, and he goes, stop, let me ask you something. When you went to the altar, what did you ask God for? And I said, well, I asked him, you know, and I gave multiple things. And he goes, no, 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 no. What, when, when he filled you with the Holy Ghost, what did you ask for? And I said, well, I asked him to forgive me. And he goes, why can't you forgive those guys? And turned around and walked off. Well, I thought, wait a minute, you're supposed to forgive people for something they did, not something they're going to do. But I learned that day, I thought, okay, I'm going to pray for them and just ask God to forgive them and see what happens. Literally, within one week, God strike me down dead if I'm lying. Within a week or so, I get a phone call from the gang in Las Vegas. They say, hey, don't worry about the gang anymore. I said, why? What happened? So the leader found God and the gang no longer exists. <laughs> so that was forgiveness. And then the guy that, uh, the, the leader that was in prison got out, came to my house. My wife just about killed me because I invited him to my house to give him a Bible study. Yeah, exactly. She said, you're teaching him the Bible study outside. <laughs> so I went outside and I taught him that Bible study. Well, he came to my church. God filled him with his, with the Holy ghost. And then we baptized him in Jesus name. So forgiveness is something that means a lot to me is because people can, can barricade themselves in a place where they can never move forward, never excel, and never grow if they can't forgive somebody and are bitter and dark and upset and hurt by something that has happened to them. But if they can break through that, life, life is so wide open to grow and to become something great and to reflect that Jesus you know, can make a huge difference in somebody's life. So that's my next step is making sure that message gets out there. I love that. I'm always, you know, telling people, you know, it's, it's the difference between am I better or better? Yeah. And, and I always want to approach situations and approach people in a better mindset, in a, a better way of life and with better words. Cause when you're bitter, you're all you're doing is hurting. people. Yes. All you're doing is hurting people. And so that forgiveness is, is, it's needed. Can, let's just be honest. Those who are listening in or live or listening to the replay of this, let's just be honest. When we don't have that forgiveness, guess what? It's you're holding on to things. And I can't be blessed with anything else if I have closed this. Right. I can't see anything else. I can't seek anything else. I can't grow if I'm holding on to all of these things. 
And I can tell you that moment when you decide that you're going to let go of something, you're going to let go of what happened to you, you let go of the words that were said about you or over you, you feel free. Even if that person never, you know, apologizes, that person never, you never see that person again, that person continues to do whatever it is they're doing, you feel free. And once you feel free, you can move forward. So I definitely love, 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 love that message. Is that going to be a message that you're going to be sharing on social media? Is Are you going to be sharing it live? Should we be looking for tickets? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sharing it everywhere. Um, the book that I wrote, The Nickname That Didn't Stick, shares some of that story in there. Um, but I'm also, I'm almost done with my third book. And uh, the first book became an Amazon bestseller, but I'm hoping that I can publish the third book a different way. Um, and I'm also looking at doing an ebook. But to be honest, I've already been sharing this message, and I have been for many years, but it's becoming greater just because my audience is bigger um you know i i can't say where to look for it mostly or where you know to be looking forward to seeing it but it's I, i'm just gonna go in many different avenues forgiveness is a powerful thing one of the things that i you hear but nobody really understands it is that forgiveness is more for you than it is for the person you're forgiving because if you think about it the person that hurts you is probably not even thinking about it anymore. They're probably sleeping well at night and they're probably living a good life. And we are beating ourselves up, allowing what they did to us or allowing the bitterness and the hurt to grow in us. And we're feeding it, we're nurturing it, we're, we're growing it like we have a green thumb and we're creating a massive amount of bitterness that we're gonna have to trim down if we're, we're not careful. But what you can realize is that if you can forgive them, the best way to forgive them is say, look, God, I'm going to give it all to you, but I don't want you to hold it to their charge. If you can literally ask God, God, I don't even want you to hold it against them. Forgive them because they don't know what they did. If you can get to that point to be able to say, look, God, don't even hold, them, hold it against them. If you can say that, you've really truly gotten to the point where you can forgive that person and life opens up. And I'm, 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 there's so many ways to look at forgiveness, but the greatest way is that you can be released from something that's held you bondage or held you captive. And once you've gotten that release and you break the chains, just the, there's, you're not limited to anything in life anymore. The life, life becomes wide open and your dreams and, and the, the goals and visions that you have for your life can be attained because you're not being held down. By your by your bitterness, which is also a burden. So now, this last question that I'm going to give you is one that kind of came from what my daughter was asking when she first heard that I was going to be interviewing you today. And I know a lot of times in the adult, well, hopefully in the adult years, we can look back at some of the things that we endured and see it as a strength. But with what you endured in the moment when you were a child, did you see it as a strength being a coda? And now that you're an adult, do you see it as being a strength? Oh, yeah. Uh, absolutely. What I would tell her, um, what they told me was my greatest or my biggest issue became my greatest asset and gave me my greatest potential. Being a CODA and knowing sign language as a first language, being a licensed and certified interpreter for the deaf, most of the people that I remember growing up with or hanging out with, and this is not to say it boastfully, I, and I don't mean it in any way, but my income is almost double most of theirs. And it, it didn't just come easy, I had to work for it. There was, there's no doubt about it. I, just because you can inter or just because you can do sign language doesn't mean that you can be an, a, a, an interpreter or a great interpreter at that. But life has given me so many rewards by taking it as a power rather than a problem. You know, so if it's if it's a problem and you look at it at, as, at it as a problem, then it will continue to be one. But if you can look at, at look at it as potential, then it can actually give you power. 
and empower you for greatness. You know, that's one of the things that Les Brown, which is, you know, has been a direct mentor to me on a couple of phone calls of talking with him and sharing my story with him. The, the things he reminds me of is remember that we all possess greatness. God designed us that way. And if we don't try to seek it out, then we're going to take it to our grave. And only like biggest regret or how many people like as Les Brown says one of the most wealthiest places on earth are in the cemetery they're in the graveyard all the dreams and all the goals all the potential that people had dies with them if they don't exercise their belief in their potential or their greatness so I would say take all the stuff that people throw against you and say you're only you're never going to make it you're never going to amount to much because you got this got going on or those that these things are going to hold you back Look at those as, as things of power, not things of problems. You know, they're not problems, they're things of power. So that's, to me, that's what's created a difference in my life. That, is, that hit the nail on the head, like just through and through. That is the mic drop moment because there are so many people, those who listen into the Speak Easy podcast are on so many different levels when it comes to being a speaker or an author. A lot of times there are those who are just in the beginning stages who are still trying to, you know, turn to realize the strength that they have, to realize that that it is not a problem, it is a power, and that it can be such a, a thing that not only can it be your power, but it will turn around and be somebody else's power as well. And that's where, you know, you expand and and you get the opportunity to connect with some great people like Les Brown. And that that opportunity opens up when you decide that you're going to move forward and go all in. So I applaud you. I am so, so thankful for you. I want to say thank you to your wife for being the amazing woman that she is, because yes, that means that she is an amazing woman to empower you in such a way to even going through (laughs) I'm sure she has some moments where she's like yeah no (laughs) (laughs) oh yeah and one of the things is you know uh, she's been requested to be in front of people and speak and be on camera but she says yeah no but she can at least vocally say thank you thank you (laughs) you are so welcome thank you for all that you would want to be on camera (laughs) <laughs> yes, because we understand that when it's a, when one person is doing it, the whole family is doing it. And I think some people miss that part, that even though it's Jim Beach is on the the the, the flyer, is on the, the brochure, is on the book, it's, it's not just Jim Beach that's showing up. Right. And so we, we, we have to, you know, be able to, to applaud that and make sure that that is well known throughout because when I show up I'm showing up as a representation of anybody that's connected to me anybody that has sewn into me my children I'm that representation every time I show up and so we decide that we're going to show up our best selves because we have some other people trailing behind us and beside us and we don't want to get in trouble (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) we don't want to get in trouble so I thank you so much for joining me today I want you to let everybody know where they can get the book um uh, if you have the release date for the new book the release date and also how they can reach out to you and get in contact with you um there's a couple of different ways but before I get that to there I want to say to your daughter to please believe in everything that she is about I mean absolutely that's one of the things as a kid I wish somebody would have told me um I became homeless at the age of 18 because I doubted in myself but if I would have had my wife just two years earlier life would have been different so I want to just let her know now from somebody as a child being beat up verbally and physically just know there's greatness within you and if you're going to um, look into sign language, look up your favorite song on YouTube and type in the letters ASL, which stands for American Sign Language. And you'll see people that have to go to school that, that are trying to um, learn so- songs and signs for their lessons. They'll do a fairly good job and they'll put it on Facebook for all of us to learn. So it's a great thing to be found on, um, on YouTube. But as far as being able to find me, my book is on Amazon. I found it on Barnes & Noble, which I knew it was going to be, but I found it on Barnes & Noble the other day, um, barnesandnoble.com. But yeah, the, the nickname that didn't stick by Jim Beach. Um, the second book, or the third book, the first book's not a public book. 
it was actually for a sales company and they have all the rights to that book. But the third book that's coming out, um, there's no release date, but if you follow me at Jim Beach, um, at, if you go to facebook.com forward slash Jim is relentless, you'll find me there. Um, or you can look up Mr. Relentless, which I have a Facebook page for that. And then the title of the book is also on Facebook um, as a, you know, a recommendation from Les Brown. So I've got a, a book page called The Nickname That Didn't Stick. But you can follow me there and definitely reach out to me in any one of those outlets. And I do respond. I do get back with you. <laughs> I love that. So guys, it's it's time for us to move. It's time for us to shake. It's time for us to definitely be empowered to love our voice. We know that there are so many great things that we have to offer the world. And it starts with you. It starts with you just saying yes to the opportunity. It starts with you making the connection. For those of you that want to connect with Jim, all his information will be in the description box. Those of you catching this live on Facebook, it will be in the comments on the Facebook page. We appreciate each and every one of you because, again, without you, the listener and viewers, there would be no Speakeasy podcast. I love you. And do not allow anybody's labels to be so stuck across whatever it is you want to do that you can't move forward. Remove the labels. Say yes to yourself. So until next time, guys, I appreciate you. Don't forget to press it out.